Welcome to this week's episode of Life Imitating Movies, a weekly podcast for myself, Mitch, and my co-host, Brad. We talk about news stories from across the internet from the past week and the movies that we think have already been made that relate to these stories. So, new week, new episode. Brad, how you doing? I'm not too bad, dude. Weather's getting nicer outside. I'm fully vaccinated, so I'm good to enjoy it. Absolutely. It feels like we're we're turning a corner weather-wise, you know, world-wise, more ways than one. So things are starting to look up, I'd say. So leading off this episode, I pose the question, what is your desert island movie? And when I say that, I don't necessarily mean your favorite movie because, for example, my favorite movie is The Dark Knight. But that's a very heavy thematic, a lot of drama and heavy subject material movie. And maybe that's not the movie I want to take to a desert island and watch over and over again. Maybe something a little bit lighter, maybe something that I can watch a million times and find new things in. So with that in mind, where did you kind of go with your desert island movie? Yeah, dude. So this one was a, uh, this one was a tough think because it was, like you said, it's not your favorite movie. My favorite movie, Arlington Road heavy flick not gonna watch it all the time and i was like all right if there's one movie i have to watch over and over again i mean that's gonna be tough every movie's gonna get get sick you're gonna get sick of and i thought of you know i was like all right maybe a comedy because you're gonna want a comedy if you're stranded on a desert island you know a million scenarios run through your head and i I just watched draft day the other day and every year i watch that i'm like i love this movie i could watch it all the time but i went with a few good men because a few good men is it's in my top top five movies all time and it's a movie that i could watch over and over and over and over again and never get sick of it Uh, it's probably my favorite script ever written aaron sorkin uh one of the best acted movies ever one of the best directed movies ever and I, i could watch that movie a million times and never get sick of it and while you're sitting there watching it on the island, you're going to be reciting the monologue because you really like it and really decided to pick that as the one you wanted to go with for different things that you've done in the past, right? Yeah, that's an embarrassing story. They they say when you audition, you should uh, never pick a well-known speech. I, uh, I My monologue for a few auditions was the Few Good Men speech, the... the, um, the uh, Son, we live in a world that has wall speech. Yeah, that's like the speech they are referencing when they say don't pick a well-known speech. And my dumb, my my idiot, uh, but went into uh, went into these auditions with that speech. Didn't get a single gig. Yeah, so for mine, I did kind of go that comedy approach. And as as soon as I say my pick, you'll kind of either roll your eyes or laugh or say, "Oh, that makes sense." But my Desert Island movie that I picked was Mean Girls. And let me tell you why. Because a comedy movie, I think there's a million different quotable lines in it. I, I, I'm i sure eventually watching it a million times, eventually I might get sick of it. But it's almost kind of one of those movies like where you obsess over a movie and you watch it a million times. And people on the internet do this all the time where they dissect different things. You know, eventually by the millionth watch... I'll come up with how the movie is a metaphor for global warming or something where I come up with this fake kind of deep meaning where I analyze all these different points and kind of create this new theory about what the movie's really about. So I kind of look at that as initially it would be entertaining and then eventually as I start to go crazy, I'll find all these hidden meanings and layers in it, kind of like people, how they dissect The Shining or something like that. Yeah, I love Mean Girls. It's a it's a great movie. It's uh, I remember when it first came out, me and my buddies, all dudes, we were like, ah, what do you want to do? You want to go see a movie or something? And everybody's like, hey, what do you want to see? And I was like, ah, I kind of want to see Mean Girls. And everybody was, you know, we all dudes get quiet. And like, yeah, I want to see that movie too. <laughs> so uh, we went and saw Mean Girls. It has something for everyone. There's no shame in admitting if you're a guy that you like this movie because it's it technically it's a chick flick, but it's just it's such an entertaining, funny, well-written, quotable movie. And it just it's it's a comedy classic. So people are lying when they say they don't like it. 
So our first story of the week deals with some severe weather hitting parts of the country, and that is tornadoes. And I'm no meteorologist, so I can't really say if this is tornado season or if this is atypical for them to be this time of year and this temperature in certain areas. I'm I'm not really an expert on that sort of thing, so I'm not going to debate about it or speculate. But it just you hate to see this because you know the stories are going to follow of people having their homes devastated and losing everything and tornadoes. We're, we're still just at nature's mercy by the end of the day. Yeah, dude. Yeah, I'm with you. I don't know if this is tornado. I feel like it might be because I think tornado season is this time of year and then hurricane season comes around October or whatever. And so I think that's how it's split up. Yeah. I mean, luckily for us, we kind of live in a decent area where we don't get hit too often with real devastating weather patterns. Um, but it's, I, you know, you watch the news channels a lot of times. And I guess you always think like people who live in like Kansas or, or, or you know, the mid middle of the country, you're like, why, why wouldn't they just move? Which is a very, obviously people can't just get up and move or whatever, but it's like, man, I, I, I don't know if I would, ever want to live in an area that continuously gets devastated by 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 tornadoes and stuff yeah it's certainly very tough and i'm sure very scary and these people probably have to have safety precautions and drills and plans ready to deal with this sort of thing when it happens so i have a feeling starting right off the bat here maybe we pick the same movie relating to this story because i feel like there's a very kind of clear-cut choice for this I have a feeling we picked the uh, same movies for a lot of our stories this week, but yeah, I I feel if we don't pick the same movie on this one, especially with that intro, I'm going to be disappointed. So I will say, did you go with the classic 90s movie Twister? I did indeed. Absolutely. I picked the same one. So Twister, this is a movie I still like watching to this day. I think it it holds up for the most part if you rewatch it here in 2021. I think the effects were pretty good for its time. And I remember, I I believe it was Universal Studios when I went there a long time ago. They used to have a Twister ride or exhibit or show or whatever it was that kind of simulated parts of the movie, which was really fun. But I think it's a great movie. And, you know, obviously, R.I.P. Bill Paxton, who was the star of this, as well as some others. Philip Seymour Hoffman, R.I.P. to him as well. He was in this, but it's still an entertaining movie and maybe provides a a look at how twisters really devastate people's lives and the damage that they do. And this kind of action and subject material that you don't really see in a lot of other movies per se. Yeah. So full disclosure, I just saw twister for the first time, maybe five or six months ago. It was one of those I bought I never watched. It was just sat up there. I knew it was going to be a fun movie to watch or whatever. And then finally I just put it in. I was like, right on. That is a good, it's a nineties movie. And you know what I mean? When I say it's a nineties, movie, it has that nineties feel to it. Yeah. It's a classic as somebody who hadn't just seen it for the first time, five or six months ago, I've seen it many times over the years and it does certainly have that kind of nineties feel to it. And I can't really put it into words that well either, but it definitely feels like a nineties movie, but in a good way, you know, I don't know if it's the acting or the way it's shot or the structure of the movie, but it definitely does feel like a nineties film, but again, in a good way. So What did you kind of think watching this for the first time? What did you think of the action, of the effects, of the acting, some of that kind of stuff? I mean, the effects are really solid. I mean, it was shot by the director was Jan DeBont, who was the DP for Die Hard and then went on to direct The Haunting and Speed and all those movies. So the the guy has a really good eye for visuals, obviously. And um, I mean, the movie was pretty famous back in the day for the the one scene of the cow flying across the screen. That was like the big thing everybody remembers from the movie was the cow. And, and it, it's a good movie, man. It's like you said, you're not going to go wrong if you got Bill Paxton and Helen Hunt and Philip Seymour Hoffman. And it's just, it was just a good watch. And I feel like it's a very compact, well-told movie because it's not this big alien invasion or things blowing up all over the place. It's a very simple story about a couple little tornadoes and these people that are trying to track them and create 
new technology to warn people about them farther ahead of time. So it's a really kind of small story that's being told on a small scale inside of a couple of towns and a cu- a handful of characters. Not too many people go in and out of the movie. So I feel like it's a very well-told, compact little story. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's a summer movie that maybe not everybody, you know, like we already said when we were talking about the story, I'm not sure people in the Midwest who have been affected by tornadoes are going to throw on Twister for that, you know, fun summer blockbuster action movie. But for people like us, good movie. Well, I mean, I may disagree a little bit because I feel like I've been talking about this obviously a lot with people lately about watching the movie Contagion because this is something that we're going through in real life right now with the pandemic. It's something similar where maybe almost watching the movie because it movies get a movie, it makes it seem worse than it is the same exact thing that you're going through in real life. So maybe watching this identical scenario in the movie almost makes you feel better about experiencing that thing in real life because it seems worse in the movie and you're thinking, oh, well, yeah, that didn't happen. So I guess maybe that's a little something to be grateful for. So maybe people who, maybe not people who lost everything in tornadoes, but maybe people who have experienced tornadoes will watch this and get a kick out of it because they can relate to it or they say, yeah, you know, I guess I was kind of lucky with how I did versus how characters in the movie are doing handling this tornado. All right. So my first story for the week was an interesting story that I saw about a, uh, a Florida student and her mother apparently rigging the homecoming queen vote. And the part that stuck out the most to me was that they potentially could face 16 years in prison for this stupid crime. Yeah, this is a kind of grabby headline and, you know, it kind of makes you think, well, is that how our system is really set up where you can get this much jail time for rigging this this homecoming queen race and other things are kind of a slap on the wrist. So it's just kind of an interesting story to read about. And, you know, obviously it's not going to be worth it when they ask her, was it worth it to end up in jail or even if it was serving a little bit of time worth it to try and win homecoming queen. So it was an interesting read because it's like when you first, when you read it, you, you see that the, the mother and the daughter were both involved in this. But the more you read, it seemed like the daughter just broke into the mother's computer and did it all herself. And which case is, is, is bad, but it's like the mother seems like she's up against jail time for this too. And it's like, she just had a crappy daughter. Why is the mother going to go to jail for this? I mean, it's almost kind of a silly story. I'm glad we can maybe laugh about it a little bit. I'm sure them and their families aren't really laughing about it. But it's just kind of one of these grabby headlines that you see from the week that kind of makes you chuckle a little bit or kind of scratch your head. So there's obviously a lot you can kind of do with this. Pick a movie that features a homecoming queen or a prom. There are plenty of them. So I doubt that we may pick the same one on this one. I thought we would pick the same movie on this one, but then you went and picked that movie as your Desert Island movie. So we will not have the same on this one as I went with Mean Girls, because I believe in Mean Girls, don't they rig the election for... um, Sort of, in the same, not exactly in the same way as this story, not to win, but to get her in the race, yes. They, They kind of fill the ballot box with votes to get the different characters nominated for Homecoming Queen. But then, obviously, Lindsay Lohan's character wins it outright. That isn't tampered with, but the process of getting there was. So I will give you credit. That is very close to this story. That is a very similar situation, for sure. That's all I want is credit. So, you know, we already kind of talked about Mean Girls up top a little bit. We've talked about it on the podcast before, but anything else you wanted to add to, you know, why you picked it for this story or what else you like about it that we haven't really mentioned lately? I mean, I like that um, the that you've had uh, the, the Mean Girls have gone on to be, I mean, uh, uh, Rachel McAdams nominated for an Oscar uh, for, uh, as we've talked about, um, Spotlight. 
And then just this past year, Amanda, Amanda Seyfried nominated for an Oscar for Mank and everything. So you've seen the trajectory of these of these people and that Lizzie Kaplan has gone on to be like a, an amazing comedic actress and, and, and very popular. So I, I, I like that this is kind of um, almost a starting point for a lot of the actresses and, and, and people we really have come to appreciate today. Yeah, it's a movie that has certainly spawned a lot of fun facts and trivia, and we won't really kind of dive too deep into them in this episode. You know, you can do that on your own time if you're listening or watching. Just Google really simple, just Mean Girls trivia, Mean Girls fun facts. But I will kind of leave it with this, where something I always found really interesting is that Tina Fey, who produced the movie, and she's obviously in it as a teacher. It's funny because Rachel McAdams, as a high schooler, Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Not Tina Fey. Let me correct myself. Amy Poehler with this fun fact. So Rachel McAdams, who plays a teenager, she's a high school student in the movie. She was closer in age at the time to Amy Poehler, who plays her mom in the movie, than she was Lindsay Lohan, who was supposed to be the same age in the movie. So I always find that a fun little trivia thing that they were actually closer in age, the mom and the daughter, than the classmates. So... Moving on, my movie, again, like I said, I, I guarantee we didn't pick the same one here. One that deals with uh, prom queen or homecoming queen. I picked the 1976 movie Carrie by Stephen King based on his novel. So obviously there's a very famous scene in there where she wins prom queen and then gets the pig's blood dumped on her and then goes on a rampage. So Carrie... Classic horror movie. What do you think of when you watch this or when you hear it? I know the scene. Never seen the movie. Never saw the remake either. Own them both because I'm a psycho and I just waste <laughs> money. But I've never sat down to watch them. I think I have it on my list to watch this coming Halloween season. You know, I like to watch my horror movies around Halloween. And, and it's on the list. But yeah, I know the scene. The scene is one of the most iconic scenes ever you know, dumping pig's blood on her. So I will say, if I could give you a homework assignment, if you'll take me up on it, I will say watch both those carries this week, and then maybe we'll kind of open the episode or just have a brief discussion about it next week, or even just offline. But I would say, of course, watch the original first, the 1976 version, and then watch the, I believe it was 2013 version with Chloe Grace Mortez, Moretz, however you say her Moretz. last name, but... You know, I think the original, since we're talking about that one, we're not going to cover the remake, but the original, I saw this for the first time years back, and obviously I had known about it, I knew about the novel, I knew about the movie, and I thought it was good for its time, but it maybe didn't really hold up spectacularly over the years, that some of the effects, of course, look, they were, they didn't really have the technology that we did today, but some of the effects because she can move things with her mind, were a little dated, but the storytelling was there, the way it was shot was pretty much there, the acting was good. So I think overall, if you go back and look at this, I think it still holds up for the most part, but it does look a little bit dated in some aspects, but I think overall it's still a very creepy, I'm not sure if creepy is the right word, but Definitely a horror-inspired movie that is still a good watch for horror fans. Now, uh, so I will ask, you know, with both of them, uh, and I, I don't think you said this. Maybe I, I don't think you did. Um, you ha you saw the remake, and if so, is it? It's a solid remake. It lives up, or at the very least, holds its own against the original. I think the remake. Uh, I think people unfairly really trash remakes when they come out. Um, I think there's a good reason I could see where they're coming from, where, look, making a, a remake of an older movie, it seems like a no-win situation because if you deviate too much, then people will say it's not like the original at all. But if you just do a rehash, then people will say it didn't do anything different. So... It's the world we live in. I don't really think that's fair because I think remakes are exactly what they should be, which are an updated version of a movie made with better technology, maybe better acting, because we've talked about this a couple of times on the show where we feel like movies have gotten better over time, better technology, better acting methods, 
better everything. So look, I'm all for, if it's done well, remaking a movie. And I think, I think the 2013 remake does some things right for sure. I think it updates things in a timely manner, both in scenarios and acting and visuals and some of those other things. And then it does kind of falter a little bit, but I give it more credit than people did at the time when it came out, that people just seem to automatically hate it because, again, it was a remake of a semi-popular movie that stuck pretty closely to the source material, which means people discredited it because it wasn't different enough so i still enjoy it it's not something i really watch that much either version the original or the remake but i think the remake is solid right on i mean as you say i will uh it's on my list it's on my stack to watch and i will get to it so a big event this past week for a lot of geek and dork and however you want to put it, or just fans of the franchise, but Star Wars Day, May the 4th, May the 4th be with you. So this is a little bit of a holiday for some people who like to celebrate, who like to dress up and do little things to recognize this day and just celebrate their Star Wars fandom. So, you know, I don't really necessarily do anything to celebrate this day, but I still like when it comes around because I like all the content that comes out and seeing the things that people do to recognize it. So I know you enjoy the Star Wars movie. You're not a big Star Wars movie fan, a a fanatic, but do you at least like that this is a a holiday of sorts and that people kind of enjoy it? I appreciate it. I I mean, it's, 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 it's one of those clever things that I'm sure just started with somebody saying, today's May the 4th. May the fourth, may the fourth, may the fourth be with you. Okay, and now it's just a national thing. So it's just a. I, I would love to. I would love to trace the lineage of how it got started, but I doubt you could. But um, it's an interesting day, you know. Uh, I was going to ask if you dress up or anything for it. Thank God you prefaced that by saying you don't, because we almost ended the podcast here today. Um, but uh it's interesting it's interesting for no more reason than i may send a uh a, a bitmoji you know with uh may the fourth with a, a lightsaber in it and that's about you know as a smart ass to my friends and that's about the extent of of how much i get into star wars day that's fair like i said everyone has their level of respect and admiration for the movies their level of enjoyability for them so you don't have to be a fanatic to enjoy the day just like that it's a thing or just say yes good for you to the people that do celebrate and do do and do something special for the day so obviously you picked a star wars movie to go along with this right i i did indeed actually you know what I'm going to change my pick. Ooh, the first time this has happened. I'm changing my pick. I'm going with a non-Star Wars yet also Star Wars movie. Ooh, ooh, this is interesting. So you had a Star Wars movie and now you just changed it in real time. So guaranteed we won't have the same one and you're taking the, the cop out on this. Clearly you almost need to pick a Star Wars movie and you decide to do something else. I, I did. Why? Because the movie that just went through my head was Fanboys. Have you ever seen Fanboys? So Fanboys is a film that came out, I don't know, 2000 something, early 2000s, mid 2000s. And it's about, it's kind of based on a true story about a kid who's dying from cancer, who takes a trip to Lucas Films to see an early cut of Star Wars Episode One: Phantom Menace. And it's the comedy movie. It's got Dan Fogel. It's got Kristen Bell. Seth Rogen's in it. Um, and it's a hilarious movie. And the only I did have Star Wars A New Hope. That was my original pick. But then I was like, fanboys. Fanboys fits this perfectly. Great. So instead of having a, a back and forth discussion about a movie that we've both seen, you picked fanboys at the last minute. So very proud of you on that one. So thank you. So what else what else can you tell us about fanboys? You know, why should people go see this? You know, it sounds like maybe it's not exactly a household name movie or it's not a mainstream movie. Maybe would you say it's an indie movie? What does it really have going for it that people should see it? 
it is an indie movie and it's and it's a it's it's a it's a hilarious movie man it's a great comedy about these star wars fans and um one of them obviously as i said he's he gets diagnosed he's gonna die he's dying of cancer and his dream is to see star wars episode one phantom menace before he passes away and so the film is about a road trip to uh uh lucas lucas films to see this print they break into lucas films and uh and it's a they have a scene at star seth rogan plays like a star trek uh trekky guy and it's it's hilarious man it's 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 it's, it's, it's just a funny funny movie and i did change it in real time because it's a movie about star wars fans going a little too far and that is kind of to a t what fanboys is about well, perhaps that's a good segue into the movie that I picked because we haven't covered this particular Star Wars movie on the podcast yet, but I wanted to talk about the much-hated, the latest Star Wars movie to hit theaters, which is Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. Now, this one was ripe with controversy, and I think people across the board not even hated it because I think there are different degrees to which people didn't really like this one. But I think across the board in general, again, if we're going by the thumbs up, thumbs down, I think the majority of people that saw this movie did not like it. And I would have to lump myself in with that crowd. I'm, I wouldn't say I'm quite as fueled by hatred as maybe some of these people that have critiqued it online, but I definitely think Disney and Lucasfilm really dropped the ball when it came to this new trilogy that I thought started with so much promise with The Force Awakens and then just spiraled out of the out of control because it seemed like, and I like to believe this is probably what happened, that they didn't really have a plan. They just wanted to crank these out as quick as possible, make as much money as possible, cram as much new stuff into them as possible to sell toys and merchandise, and again, it's just all about the dollar bill. So I like to think that this is a lesson learned from them moving forward with the Star Wars franchise. Yeah, the first, the so the first or whatever, seventh movie came out. Um, um, wow, this was what sucks when we do these. My brain just draws a blank. What's the first one called? The seventh one? The Force Awakens. Force Awakens, thank you. So The Force Awakens came out and... I loved Force Awakens. I saw that movie, I think, four times in theaters. Even I went to Atlantic City with my buddies, and I had lost money. And I was like, you know what? There's a true IMAX theater over at this, at the, uh, I think it was the Tropicana or something. I was like, I'm going to watch Star Wars Force Awakens in this true IMAX theater. You all can continue to lose money. And so I went and saw it there and everything. I left my friends. Loved it. And that's the thing, man. It really seemed like it was setting up an established story it knew it seemed like they knew where they were going from one to two to three and then two hit and certain things happen in two that make you go okay that's that's weird but i'm sure there's still some connective tissue what's going on here and then three hits and you're just like okay they were just winging it i still enjoyed three i you know i i can't lie i did enjoy it but it just was like okay they they didn't have a plan. Yeah, it really seems like that. And they'll never admit that, of course, because it's suicide to admit you made a mistake as a giant corporation. But most people have guessed the truth on that. It seems that they just didn't have a plan. Just crank these out as quick as possible just to make a buck. So hopefully they've learned their lesson. Maybe not, but we'll see. But you're right. I watched The Force Awakens in theaters and... I just felt like a little kid watching it because I just had this dumb smile on my face just watching the movie almost the entire way through. And then I will say I didn't really like The Last Jedi either. And then obviously Rise of Skywalker was kind of a course correction to try and tie it back more into The Force Awakens than The Last Jedi. But in doing so, it just didn't really stick its landing because again, they just tried to crammed too much into it and they just went from point A to B to C without much explanation or story structure or character depth and it just 
it just felt like a shell of a of a good movie, you know. Oh, yeah, the only thing I'll say without giving any spoilers, and I'll just say one word, and you'll know exactly why I was disappointed. Snoke. Yeah, so that's fair. We we haven't really gone into spoilers yet in this discussion about the rise of Skywalker, and it's still a pretty new movie, only two or three years old at this point. But I will say, if you if somehow if you're a Star Wars fan and haven't seen this movie yet and haven't had anything spoiled by the, the internet, which is a miracle in and of, it, of itself, but we won't spoil anything, but I just felt like there were a lot of missed opportunities, both in terms of character moments and story beats and just a lot of missed opportunity here. Yeah. Well, we'll see. I mean, I think, um, What's his name? Ryan Johnson is is going to be doing a new trilogy. I think with with Star Wars, they announce things, and then two months later, three months, two years later, it's like ah, oh, that's no longer happening. But I believe Ryan Johnson is doing a new trilogy, and no matter if you didn't like uh, Rise of Sky or the Last Jedi, the one he did, dude's a talented filmmaker. Dude made dude made uh, Knives Out, which is phenomenal. So. I, 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 do, I, I don't doubt interested. that, but I am not looking forward if he is still doing a Star Wars trilogy because, again, I did not like The Last Jedi. So, again, you're right, though. It changes every day with who's directing, what's being made, blah, blah, blah. But, again, I like to think that they're on the right track because I like to think that they're noticing how many views and what people are saying about their current Star Wars projects, like The Mandalorian, and like this Obi-Wan show that will be coming out. So hopefully they take a look at that and look at the feedback that they're getting from the fans and the directors and the people who are making those and start to go in a, a good direction with the movies. So yet to be seen, only time will tell. All right, so my next story up is a story, movie story that came out this week, which is Apple TV, Apple TV+. Plus. They acquired the new Tom Hanks uh, science fiction movie called Finch, which was formerly called Bios, which was one I was, I was still am looking forward to. It's Tom Hanks. I'm always going to look forward to a Tom Hanks movie. But um, the big reason I picked this man is because just this week alone, dude, I think, I think there are like four or five movies that were announced as bypassing theaters and going directly to streaming. This streaming service crap has gotten out of hand for my money. I, I don't know how you feel about that stuff. I agree with you. More and more these days, we see all these different advertisements for things and movies that are exclusively on different streaming platforms. And if you don't have the money or the patience or whatever it is to buy and subscribe to all these different platforms and watch all this different content that's being churned out, then how are people supposed to see this movie that people have worked so hard on and that they want to get more exposure to. So I think it's, it is kind of like a lose-lose situation where when you start to take movies out of theaters and put them onto streaming services that not as many eyeballs are going to get on them. And especially for me personally with Apple TV or Apple TV plus, whatever it's called, because I feel like this is one of the, the less desirable streaming platforms on there where I haven't really seen that much content on their platform that I've really said to myself, wow, that looks really interesting. I really need to go on to Apple TV Plus just to watch that. There haven't really been too many out there like that for me. So I'm not sure if I'm going to see this one when it comes out. I will say for Apple TV Plus, which is their streaming, the played paid platform, they do have three things out right now that I do genuinely enjoy, which is uh, they had the original Tom Hanks movie, which was supposed to go theatrical, but coronavirus, which was Greyhound, which was a very good movie. Uh, they have The Morning Show with Reese Witherspoon, Steve Carell, and Jennifer Aniston, which is an excellent show. And uh, season two just dropped today of a hilarious show called Mythic Quest Raven's Banquet from the creators of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. And... Uh, so I do enjoy those shows. Um, yeah, I'm still working. You know, I work with my free my free preview. I think I paid for one month of Apple TV. And then, you know, I get my free previews of them. But to that's the problem, too, is a lot of times these streaming services, they release 
a movie once every couple of months that you want to watch or whatever. And then essentially you're paying 15 bucks for a month of the streaming to watch one movie as opposed to like good continuous content or whatever. And, and, and like you said, no fanfare. These movies have no fanfare. I, I think about the Netflix movie that just came out, Stowaway, with Anna Kendrick and Tony Collette. That was a theatrically released movie that would have fanfare. That had people talking, big actresses, big sci-fi movie. It was a good movie. I enjoyed it. But nobody's really talking about it. And I think that's what happens with these streaming movies is they, they get dropped on a day, and then within two weeks, they're kind of just forgotten about. So hopefully for this one, did you pick a Tom Hanks movie related to the story or did you try to branch out like the Star Wars and do something different and not go something somewhere where we would have a mutual discussion about something? I mean, now I kind of want to branch out and change my pick, but no, I went with the Tom Hanks movie. So Tom Hanks, it's still hard to pick the same movie with him because he's had so many, so many hits. So I highly doubt that we had the same one, but... What Tom Hanks movie did you pick related to the story about him and his new movie coming out? So the movie sounds interesting. It's a sci-fi movie where Tom Hanks essentially plays by himself. Uh, uh, and he's basically the story is he has to, uh, he creates, he wants to create, a, it's a post-apocalyptic world where he wants to create a robot to take care of his dog after he dies. So he's by himself. And so what classic Tom Hanks movie is there where he's by himself? I went with Castaway. And that's I mean, fair. We've, we've already covered Castaway on a previous episode related to a story where an actual real life couple was stuck on a deserted island for a period of time. So we've already kind of delved into this a little bit. But what else did you want to kind of add talking about Castaway here on this episode? Just that I have to up my ginkgo bilobo because I don't remember that at all. <laughs> but I, it's a great movie. I think Tom Hanks should have won the Oscar for that one because it's a great movie that is hinged on his performance. Exactly. And we've talked about that on the previous episode where we covered this movie where it takes a lot of talent to keep people and audiences interested when there's only essentially one character on screen and you have to get them to interact somehow with something so it's not just silence for 90 minutes while they just run around and just have their own thoughts running about in their heads. So enter Wilson, the volleyball, and a character that not that many people probably thought by the end of the movie they would be getting emotional about when he lost him at sea. So a very creative, very different movie, and I think still holds up today. Very emotional as well, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when you said Wilson, that triggered. I do remember talking about Castaway before now. So what's your movie, dude? So I decided to go with the first, I believe, what was the first Tom Hanks movie that I ever saw. And that was the movie Big. And this is obviously a classic. I don't believe we've covered this one on the show before. But Big is just such a fun movie. Tom Hanks is just so young in this one. And it's just... He has such, obviously, childlike energy because he's a kid that's been put into an adult body by Zoltar. And it's just such a classic, fun movie that it tries to, you know, convey the message to reach out to your inner child and to look at things from a childlike perspective and really try not to get weighed down too much by the adult world and the decisions that we have to make every day and just try and discover some of the, that childlike wonder in everyday life. So Big is a classic. It's a movie I still love watching every every time I can. So obviously I'm sure you like it as well. Yeah, I absolutely love Big. I watched it not too long ago either too. And uh, actually when I did my whole Tom Hanks, I did a deep dive of Tom Hanks at the start of the pandemic, just watched every Tom Hanks movie there was. And Big is one of the best. That was his first Oscar nomination for Best Actor. So recently, uh, Elizabeth Perkins came out and she was talking about how uh, Robert De Niro was originally cast in the role as of Josh Baskins, which would have been a completely different movie if De Niro had taken it on. A lot less childlike wonder, probably a lot more like serial killer vibes almost. Well, I'm not sure about serial killer vibes, but I think it would have been maybe a more forgettable movie if Robert De Niro was in the role instead where... 
I don't think it would have had that same lasting impact. And I don't think he would have gotten that message across that the movie was going for as well. So I think it wouldn't have been a complete failure, but I don't think, I don't think it would have been nearly as memorable if Robert De Niro was in the lead as the child that was suddenly in the adult body as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a great movie. I mean, it's one of the most iconic when they do the, uh, the piano scene with the feet with the, the feet piano it's like one of the most iconic scenes ever and uh you know you go to a, i don't know if you've ever been to fao schwartz in, in new york city right right next to where the christmas tree is out there but they they have the piano thing lined up and they let kids go in and play on it and everything and i stand there watching i'm like i really want to jump on this thing but i can't so our next story here deals with a prominent figure in late night talk show which is Conan O'Brien is finally calling it quit after multiple years of being on air, many years, and his last show is going to be this coming June is when the run is finally going to come to an end. So I don't really follow along with every single late night show out there because there's too many and there's not enough time to watch all of them. But in what I've seen from Conan O'Brien more and more over the years, the more I respect him and think he's funny and think he's intelligent and interviews well and it is going to be kind of sad to see him go always when there's this retiring or passing of the torch of a classic late night show talk host that then is either goes on to somebody else or retires completely yeah i am a massive conan o'brien fan i think he's he is probably my favorite of the late night hosts because i find him to be the most naturally funny out of all of them. And a lot of that has to do, he does a podcast called Conan O'Brien needs a friend. And it's one of the few podcasts that I listen to as soon as the episodes drop, because they are absolutely hilarious. And I've been watching O'Brien probably since he started, dude. I mean, 93, I think was his, was when he started with a late night. Um, and you know, watch them as he as he did that move through to Tonight Show, short lived Tonight Show, and then I watch his his TBS show and his his um his remotes, which is you know when they go out of studio to shoot something. For my money, those are some of the funniest things you will ever watch. Just watching Conan O'Brien deal with people and be spontaneous and improv and make fun of people. That's Conan O'Brien at his best. Yeah, certainly a funny guy. Going to be different and maybe a little sad to see him go. But it's funny because when I looked up what movies or shows he may have been in, and there were more than I thought there were. So I picked one that I thought I didn't know he was in. I sort of remember him being in when I realized it. I thought about it. But that's the movie The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. And... He makes a brief appearance in this movie. He shows up, obviously, as himself in the daydreams of the main character, Walter Mitty, played by Ben Stiller, who is being interviewed on his show. So it's kind of a loose thread to kind of connect it to this story. But Secret Life of Walter Mitty, I think it's an enjoyable, kind of an underrated movie that kind of captures this feeling of wanderlust, which makes you want to get out and explore and go on trips and go to new places. And it really kind of stirs that up in you because obviously that's kind of the journey that the main character goes on in this movie. So is this one that you've seen? And if so, what did you kind of think of it when you saw it? Yeah, yeah I did see it. I've seen it a few times. It's uh, I remember it was, so on Christmas day, a lot of times uh, my family celebrates Christmas and after we open presents, a lot of times we would just sit there and do nothing for a few hours. So I started buying movie tickets and Walter Mitty was one of the movies we saw on when it came out on Christmas day. And uh, yeah, I love it. I like, I like the fact that, you know, may, maybe you're the same way, but you know, I daydream about, you know, making it in the entertainment industry. So I have these daydreams of, 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 of success and, 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 you know, my name in the lights. So I don't actually dream of my name in the light, but, you know, I, I daydream about bigger and better things. And that's, I appreciated the, the movie for that, for, you know, it, it's a movie that really tells you to uh, go after what it is you want. And I appreciated that. 
Absolutely. I think it has an enjoyable, relatable message to it. But I also did enjoy this movie for the visuals as well, not only with the beauty of nature and the shots that these different scenes across the world that he's in, but the visuals I think are really interesting when you go between reality and his daydreams or when you can't really tell what's real or what's not. Again, the visuals that they kind of do with these cool little transitions into different shots or add elements to the real life that then make it into a dream world. I think it's really interesting with the visuals that it does in this movie with some of those different areas. Yeah, I, 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 the, the shot that really sticks out to me is when Ben Still is running down the hallway and has all the covers in the background, which are kind of him in different scenarios. And that's like a, a memorable shot that, uh, that really is a, a gnarly shot. Yeah, or when he's looking at a photo that comes to life or the background just kind of dissolves around him and suddenly he's in the Arctic or it's just, again, a very interesting visual movie. So maybe one that's maybe not a household movie or a mainstream movie hit with audiences. So I would definitely recommend this one for people to check it out if they maybe haven't heard of it or have heard of it, but haven't quite seen it yet. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I guess I'll throw out my pick now. My pick is more in line with Conan O'Brien. I don't know if you ever saw it. It's a documentary called Conan O'Brien Can't Stop. And essentially what happened was after the Tonight Show, NBC, the contract he signed, made it he couldn't appear on TV for a matter of time. So he was legally prohibited from talking uh, on TV at all. So he launched a tour called the Conan O'Brien Legally Prohibited from Talking Tour. And he, and he chronicled that in this documentary called Conan O'Brien Can't Stop, which just chronicled all the tours and everything. And honestly, it, it was a great documentary, not just for the funny of the tour of the shows but he really delve into kind of Conan O'Brien's psyche of losing his dream his dream was to host the tonight show that is what he dreamed his entire life and to have it be short so short-lived you really you, the, the, this documentary really delves into kind of the the almost depression that happened after it was taken away from him so this sounds like obviously it's a very personal story for Conan O'Brien. So would you say, because it definitely sounds like it sounds like it, that we get to know him better as an individual and his goals, motivations, what he's like by watching this documentary. Without a doubt. Oh yeah. And it's, it's, you, it's a great stop gap or bridge gap between, between his time at NBC and then his time at TBS. It really is a great, bridge between that because i think a lot of times you you we, we know these performers as performers if you only watch conan o'brien cursory or sometimes you only know conan o'brien the performer and this movie i really like because as you say it, it delves into conan o'brien the person you see him vulnerable you know you see him not trying to be funny and not trying to make everybody laugh but to really delve into like man, this happened in my life and it, it sucked. And it's like, you, you really get to know him. Absolutely. It sounds like a good deep dive into his personality for people who enjoy that sort of thing about getting to know somebody outside of a few clips they may have seen them in. So it definitely sounds like a good deep dive into his character. Yeah. That's all I got to say about that. All right. So my last story of this week is, is perhaps my favorite and it, and it, it really is a, continues our theme of award shows because apparently there's a fast food award show that this is only the second year it's in existence. And I just came across this article. I, I must have been searching for something and I saw it and just clicked on it. And it just, it was funny the way the article was rolled out. It wasn't just an article, it actually had like the nominees. It, it looked like you were looking at an Oscar sheet, but for fast food. And uh, so we'll get you our, your opinions on the article first, and then maybe we'll delve into some of these winners. Yeah, I thought it was pretty funny because it's not totally unexpected when I saw this, though, because there's award awards out there for all sorts of things. And it's to get people talking and it's to get awareness out there for things that people might not know awards are given out to. And to be fair, this is the awards given by this website, not an official board of people that vote and declare this is the best fast food whatever. So 
little websites kind of do this all the time and publish articles, stories, videos, content creators. Everyone kind of does their their top whatever because it's a discussion. It gets people talking and really kind of opens these different channels to talk about different things that people might relate to or know of. So yeah, I thought this was a funny kind of interesting read. And as always with things that are given out with awards, I kind of agreed and disagreed with some of their picks, of course. So yeah, this was certainly a fun and interesting read. So I did write a few categories down, you know, you got to go with the category. Would you agree that the best nuggets are Chick-fil-A? Yeah, it it depends on who you are. It depends on your taste buds. It depends on which chain you like that you're loyal to that you think, okay, I like McDonald's fries, but I like Chick-fil-A's nuggets better or something like that. So I I kind of agree with that particular one because it seems like their actual good kind of chicken that they make, their nuggets at Chick-fil-A, as opposed to maybe some other ones, they're kind of more frozen or they just kind of come off an assembly line. So I kind of agree with that particular category. Okay. Okay. Now, next up, we have best fish sandwich. Now, best fish sandwich for me was a controversial pick. Uh, it went to the new Popeyes, whatever they call it. And for me, the best fish sandwich is a Checkers Deep Sea Double. It's one of my favorites, obviously. This, this is a chin built by Deep Sea Doubles. So I don't know. Are you a fish sandwich connoisseur? Yeah, I will say seafood or fish isn't necessarily something I get when I go to fast food places because that seems a little risky. It's like getting seafood at a diner. So I can't say I'm really an aficionado on that. And I really don't recommend that people really go lots of seafood at fast food either. I can't really give that endorsement. So I will say go read it for yourself if you haven't seen this article. There's a long list of categories. We won't deep dive into all of them, but I think fish... I think you could go to other places and pay a little bit more to have a little bit less risk for yourself personally. All right. I will. I want to give one last, and that was this year's Lifetime Achievement winner. I went to White Castle, and I thought that was a worthy successor to last year's winner, Ketchup. It's certainly interesting, <laughs> to be sure. So that actually serves as a good segue into my movie, where I tried to look at a movie where – a fast food chain was either featured prominently or it was somehow in the title. And the only one that really comes to mind with that is Harold and Kumar go to White Castle. Is that the same movie that you picked this? No. Well, I felt like that you're, was an obvious pick that we may have picked the same one. But I think you're, you're if, lead I'm, up, man. if I'm not mistaken, we may have talked about this movie before at some point on the podcast. So we'll keep this one a little bit brief, but such a great comedy. I think this really kind of propelled Cal Penn and John Cho into the spotlight and really made people respect them as actors or comedians. So I think this is just a fun, zany, classic comedy that has definitely has some adult beats to it, but it's still very funny and a very good start to their kind of trilogy, the Harold and Kumar trilogy that they have. Very enjoyable movie for me. Oh, yeah. I love all three Harold and Kumar movies. I watch the Christmas one every year. It's, it's one of my favorites. Um, Yeah. Uh, what can you say? I remember when I first heard the title, I was like, that sounds dumb. And then I saw it in theaters and I was like, that was phenomenal. Yeah, I think I may have had the same reaction. So, again, if for some reason you haven't seen it or don't really know about it, don't judge necessarily by the title. Judge by watching the actual movie. So, where did you kind of go? Because again, I thought that was maybe a little bit of a layup that you picked the same one, but I'm interested to see where you kind of went with yours. I too thought my pick was a layup and I thought for sure, even with your intro, I was like, you were picking the same one because I went with Good Burger. Mm. It's a classic, man. Come on. Welcome to Good Burger. You're right. That is another good pick. And I guess maybe I didn't really think of that one because it's not technically affiliated with a name brand fast food chain. And we've covered ones on the podcast already that have kind of dealt with that sort of thing where we talked about the founder, which deals with obviously Ray Kroc and McDonald's. So we didn't want to really repeat that one. And then I know you love talking about Demolition Man because they have that timely Taco Bell reference in there. But I'm glad you did kind of go a little bit different, yet still picked one related to this story. 
I yeah, dude. Good Burger. See, this might be a generational thing. I, I for me, Good Burger is a childhood favorite. I I, I grew up with all that. So I love the sketches. Then the movie came out. I saw, I remember seeing it in theaters. It's, it's hilarious. It's got quotes that me and my friends will still quote to this day, you know, home with the big booty burger, um, you know, dumb crap like that and stuff. It's just, it's one of those movies I can go back to and watch and crack up. And then just reminds me of simpler times. No, it definitely is a classic for me too. I, I grew up on Nickelodeon and all that and Keenan and Cal too. So certainly kind of has uh, some nostalgia for me as well. And it's not necessarily something you really see available on a lot of streaming services these days, because that's how our content is delivered to us. But it is something that I enjoy watching if I can find it, if I come across it, that I like kind of reliving that part of my childhood and kind of having those those triggers by watching the movie. Yeah, yeah. That's two good comedies we pick, so food-based. So wrapping up with our movie of the week, we decided to pick one that has something to do with a new release movie coming out soon. And that is the 2004 version of Dawn of the Dead, directed by Zack Snyder. And this was actually Zack Snyder's directional debut, which I think I had heard in the past that I had heard that fact. But when I was kind of looking this movie up for this week's episode, I thought that was really interesting because... It's a very solid first effort from him, but it doesn't really carry too, too much of his style that he's kind of adapted into the rest of his movies down the road. But the reason we picked this one is because it kind of is a good segue into Army of the Dead, which is going to come out soon here in the near future that we're going to cover on the show, also directed by Zack Snyder. So do you think this is a good show of things to come for Army of the Dead? by looking at Dawn of the Dead and saying, yes, this is a good movie. Absolutely. Yeah. I love, our, uh, I love, I, you're right in that. It's not like his later movies in that it is more comical. His, his other movies have been really dark, obviously the DC universe. And yeah, I actually went back and watched this last night as I hadn't seen it in over 10 years, probably. And it holds up, dude. And, and full disclosure, I never saw the original. Never saw the R Romero version. And so I, I, I can't say whether or not this is, you know, one of the better remakes ever made, as I simply haven't seen the original to compare it. But as a standalone movie, and I'm not a big zombie guy. I don't really like zombie movies that much. But as a standalone movie, I think this movie's pretty, it's almost perfect in terms of a zombie horror type movie. It's it's hilarious. It was written by, which I'm sure one of your facts that you have written down, was written by James Gunn who is phenomenal and he's he, he's good at, at creating comical scripts and stuff and uh uh you could see his direction in the opening scene for my money that opening scene is one of the best opening scenes i've ever seen it is it is awesome the way they intro this movie yeah it certainly opens with a bang and really grabs you and doesn't let go from the get-go so I agree. I really should probably see the original. I haven't seen it either, and I'm sure it's very good. Obviously, classic horror director with the original Dawn of the Dead, but I really do think this is a very solid movie as well, where you get to know the characters, you have real stakes, it's an interesting setting, it's done very well, because I think you're right where zombie movies, especially in the, I would say, kind of 2010s, maybe a little bit before that, zombie movies kind of peaked and that there were a lot of them coming out. And if they weren't done well, then they were bad. But if they were done very well, then they were amazing. And I think that's certainly true where if you make a very good zombie, zombie movie, that it holds up over time, that it's very entertaining and it could maybe appeal to people of different core values who maybe don't really like horror movies but are interested in maybe checking different ones out if it's a zombie movie that's done very well. And I certainly think that's Dawn of the Dead in this case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's so much that works for this movie. I think the song choices in this movie are phenomenal. Yeah, the opening Johnny Cash song is like perfectly placed. Um, there's the song later, Richard Cheese. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but what he does is he takes these like uh, 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 filthy songs, you know, songs that have a lot of curse words, adult themes, and he turns them into lounge music. And so in this movie, he does it with Don, uh, with uh, Down with the Sickness, it disturbs Down with the Sickness. 
and this was the first movie I ever saw. I remember seeing it in theaters and, and kind of just laughing my ass off at it. It was, it was great. And I've become a big Richard Cheese fan since then. I own all of his CDs and everything. And, 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 and that's a big thing. And the music for this one just played into the comedy even of the movie. Yeah, so I agree with you. I do really like the, the soundtrack to this one too. And this movie, again, why we picked it, because it almost does kind of feel like a spiritual predecessor to army of the dead so that is a movie that i'm very much looking forward to and if anything can be told from dawn of the dead and how Zack snyder did with that and how he will do with army of the dead once people get to see it and it comes out i'm really looking forward to it because i think dawn of the dead very solid zombie movie very good just character examination movie as well so i'm very much looking forward to what he can do on a bigger scale with a different story and different zombies and a different year now with army of the dead. Yeah. And the trailer for army of the dead does look like, like you said, a spiritual sequel. It looks like it's coming back to a lighthearted zombie movie, which is very much what his remake of Dawn of the dead was a, a movie that's going to splash humor and and the colors i don't know if you saw the colors like neon colors throughout it looked it looks awesome yet it still has stakes and it still has horror and it still has a little bit of sadness as well those little touches because you still need those as well but if you're having fun and you're enjoying the movie then that's obviously a big benefit too so we're going to cover army of the dead once it comes out in a few weeks or so so look forward to that that's going to be our big new release movie on an episode in the near future and we're both looking forward to it. Hopefully we both enjoy it more than our last new release movie, which was Mortal Kombat that we covered on the show. So I'm very much looking forward to Army of the Dead. I too am looking forward to Army of the Dead on Netflix, on a streaming service. Thank you to everybody for watching, listening, another episode of Life Imitating Movies weekly podcast with myself and my co-host Brad. We certainly appreciate it. Hopefully we've had some enlightening discussions, made some good recommendations in the movie department, or made you learn about some new stories that you didn't hear about this past week. So look forward to another episode from us next week. Same time, same bat channel, Monday, 10 a.m. Eastern. So Brad, anything you want to say to close out this week? That it. Good episode. Look forward to next week. Absolutely. So we'll have some more movie recommendations. We'll have some more interesting discussions. Hopefully, hopefully we, we bring some new things to the table. So look forward to that and you'll see us next week.